Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the house of the Lord. As you find your seats this morning, Let's hear a word from the Lord as we begin in Psalm chapter 115, which says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name goes all the glory, for your unfailing love and faithfulness. Why let the nations say, Where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. The dead cannot sing praises to you, Lord. For they have gone into the silence of the grave, but we can praise the Lord both now and forever. Praise the Lord. This morning as we've gathered here, we have the privilege of being in the land of the living. How many of you are glad to be alive this morning? The scripture says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Would you all join with me in shouting a great big loud Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And this morning as we sing, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to praise the Lord. I want to encourage you to focus your mind on the Lord as you worship him. Every song that you sing, think about the words as it applies to worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Our God is a good God. Amen. He is an awesome God and I am looking forward to what he has in store for us today. And so as we begin this service, would you raise your level of anticipation? Let the Spirit of God arise faith in your heart so that your ear can hear what the Spirit has to say, so that you can bless the Lord with all that is within you today. And if you would, please join me in standing as we welcome the presence of the Lord in this sanctuary. Father, we bless your name, and we thank you for the privilege that we have to gather here together to honor you. Lord, we thank you for every blessing that you've provided. Each day of this past week, you have walked with us. Whether through good times or bad, you have been faithful. You have stuck with us through every single moment. And we thank you, Lord, that today is no exception, that we are here with your presence. And I'm so thankful that even though we cannot see you with our natural eyes, we see your handiwork. We see your handiwork in creation all around us. We see your handiwork in each other. For you have made all of us unique and special. You made us in your own image. And you made us to worship you. And so that's what we're going to do today. We spend a lot of time working and playing and doing different things. But today we set aside this time to focus our attention on you, Almighty God. And you're so worthy of it. So we honor you this morning. We welcome your Holy Spirit in this place. And may you move in our hearts and in our minds this morning. To you be all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You ready to praise the Lord? Amen. Me too. Let's worship the Lord today. Well, God bless you, church. Hallelujah. God bless you, church. Thank you. Hallelujah. I was just, um, in Psalms 8, verses 3 to 4, it says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. And I thank God for this scripture because of once we understand how big God is and how small we are, and how he still loves us, and not only is he mindful of us, and not only as the scripture says here that he's going to visit us, but he wants to live in us. And that is an amazing thing, that God would want to live in us, something like me, that if, that if, that if some of our thoughts were put up on the screen, <laughs> some of us would probably leave with less friends than we came in with. But God still loves us, and he, not only that, he wants to visit us and he wants to live in us. We have a friend in Jesus, amen? Thank you, Lord God.
that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call. Is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing, who am I, Lord? Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? We worship you, God, because of we're the only creation that, we, that you call your friends, Jesus, and we worship you, God. And we worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, God. And you call us your friends, Jesus.
we're singing for the glory of the risen King, Jesus. We're singing for your glory, Jesus. morning, God. It's not about us. It's not about our mental real estate, what's going on there, Jesus. It's all about you this morning, God. Oh, Lord Jesus, we dedicate our lives to you this morning, Jesus, our minds, God. In the name of Jesus, our voices, we lift them up to you, Jesus. Oh, Lord God, we dedicate this time to worshiping you and praising you this morning, God. Oh, Lord Jesus, we sing for the glory of the risen King. We don't sing for no one. We only sing for your glory, Jesus. We only sing for your glory, sing for your glory, Jesus. singing to the throne of God right now.
burning rock I stand All of the ground is sinking sand All of the ground is sinking sand On Christ's solid rock I stand thank you for what you have done and what you are doing. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you see us as we are. You love us, but you also transform us. And today is another opportunity for us to become more like you, Jesus. You are the potter and we're the clay. And so we say to you with our hearts this morning, Continue the work, God. Continue the work. So that when the world looks at us, they will see less of us and more of you. I pray that to be the case for us individually, in our marriages, in our families, and in this church body. May we reflect the glory of the Almighty God. May we not be only talk, but may we live out the life and the love of God. Lord, we thank you for meeting with us this morning. Thank you we've been able to sing and worship you. May you continue to move all across this sanctuary and touch every heart, every mind, every spirit, every physical body. For you are a God who is able to make us come completely whole. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Take five minutes. Find someone that you would like to greet and tell them that you're glad they're here in the house of the Lord today.
This morning I'd like to share a story with you entitled, Who Owns Your French Fries? So, it is the story of a man who buys his little boy some French fries. And like any good father does, he reaches over and takes one of the fries to taste it. I think you all can identify with that. The little boy pushes his father's hand and says, don't touch my French fries. The father thinks that his son is uh, selfish. The father knows that he bought the French fries and they belong to him. The father knows that his son belongs to him as well. The father could get angry, never buy his son any French fries again to teach his son a lesson, or the father could bury his son in French fries. The father then thinks, why is my son, so, uh, why is my son selfish? I have given him a whole package of French fries. I just want one French fry. You see, God has given us money, and when he asks for a tithe, people figuratively slap his hand away and say, keep your hands off of my money. God owns everything we have. He wants us to manage what we have for his glory. God expects us to manage our time, talent, temper, testimony, and treasures. And two, to give back a portion of what he has given us. Amen? Ushers, if you can come forward. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we are so thankful. Thankful for everything that you have blessed us with, Lord Father. Lord, and we thank you in advance for everything that you are going to give us, Lord. Father, although it may seem little, Lord God, but it's much, Lord Father. Lord, we ask that you continue to multiply these offerings, Lord Father. Continue to help us to find ways, Lord God, to use them to proclaim your kingdom, Lord Father, and continue to advance it. Bless these offerings, Lord God, and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. If you would please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelations. Chapter 2. Dear Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit, who was sent to lead and guide us into the truth, would minister today. Let the words from these pages become alive. And I pray that not only would we understand them, but that we will have a heart to do them. Lord, as you said to each of these churches that we are looking at, let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit is saying. So we choose to tune our attention and to listen to what your Spirit has to say to us today. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Revelation chapter 2. We have looked at what Jesus had to say to the church in Ephesus. Last week, we looked at what the Spirit had to say to the church in Smyrna. And today, we're going to look at what he had to say to the church in Pergamum. Write this letter he says in verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, this is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne. Yet, you have remained loyal to me. You refuse to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give to each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands 
except the one who receives it. As we look at what Jesus had to say about the church in Pergamum, first of all, Jesus introduces himself in this letter as the one with the sharp two-edged sword. Jesus is the living word, and this is the written word. Jesus came to live out and to fulfill what was written. So when you read the word of God, you are reading what was fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, God's desire is that the word of God will become a part of us. That the word of God will be sown in our hearts and that it will bring forth a great increase. God's word was not simply intended for education, although it was. But it was also intended for transformation. You see, there is more that God does than dealing through your mind. There are certain things that God does and we can mentally track and say, oh, I see why God did that and I'm glad he did. But there are also things that God does in our lives that you and I cannot grasp. Anybody ever been there? You're walking through a difficult situation and your question is, God, what is going on around here? How are you in the midst of this? Where are you in the midst of this? I may not feel your presence. I may not see your work. But it's in those moments where your mind cannot register what is going on. But in those moments, we must also trust that God is at work. And so you and I can trust the character of God, and we believe even when our mind cannot fully grasp. And so the Word of God, God's Word tells us, is a sharp two-edged sword. And it divides through bone and marrow. It gets uh, right down deep in between the thoughts and the intentions of our heart and our mind. Just as the Word of God is a two-edged sword, so is Jesus, the living Word. And when you invite Him into a difficult situation, when there is chaos going all around, and there can be a lot of confusion because everything sometimes is not as clear as we'd like it to be. When you invite the presence of the living word, what you're inviting is a sharp two-edged sword to be able to properly divide between what is not right and what is right. There have been situations as pastor that I've had to say, God, unless you give wisdom here, I have no idea what's going on. Sometimes... Uh, the, the water can be so muddy, you don't know. You don't know what's happening. I remember a situation I had to work through where one person in the church said one thing, the other person said another. And it was very difficult to discern who was telling the truth. And I had to ask the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, for guidance and direction. And step by step, little by little, the truth came out. But sometimes it's a messy process. But God, he sees everything anyways. It's us who are a little bit blinded to what's going on. You know what I mean? God's not in heaven uh, putting together an investigative team. He already knows. It's us. We have to figure out. We've got to search and all these kinds of things. So... The first point here is that God looks at this church. He already discerns the thoughts and the intents of our heart. He knows not only what we do, but why we do what we do. Never hesitate to bring a messy situation to the hands of the Almighty God. Father, I pray that you would move by your Holy Spirit.
everything okay? Everything all right? Yeah. Okay. I thought I had my game with me. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. With it. Oh, no problem. So make sure you're okay. All right. Not only did Jesus introduce himself as the one who had a two-edged sword, but then he goes into, once again, as he did to the churches in the past, saying, I know. Now, if you look back, for example, in chapter 2 to the church in Ephesus, verse 2, he says, I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know. He goes on to reveal to them what he knows. To the church in Smyrna, verse 9, he says, I know about your suffering. He goes on to explain the details of what was going on in that church. And now to the church in Pergamum, he says also, verse 13, I know. Remember this, God knows everything about you. He says, I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne. Now think about that for a moment. How many of you, when you're looking for a place to live and you've got your real estate agent and they're giving you all kinds of options, how many of you would say, sure, I'll purchase a house in the city where Satan has his throne? Now, willingly, we probably wouldn't pursue that, right? But you and I need to remember something. We live on a planet where the enemy is the prince of the power of the air. And even though we look forward to the day when Jesus comes back and he's going to completely rule and reign, the Scripture says even he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron, he's going to have everything in order but for now, we are dealing with the consequences of our disobedience as a human race. And really what we did all the way back to Adam was we said, God, don't mess in my business. And God said, basically, all right, I'll let you see what happens when I don't mess with your business. Now, the day is going to come when he is going to rule and reign, but until then, we deal with the effects and the consequences of our disobedience. And yet the wonderful thing is, is when we come to the Lord and we ask him to rule and reign in our heart, we give him, in essence, domain there. And so it's like a microcosm of what's going to happen in the future on this entire planet. It happens in our own being. So what you say is basically, Lord, I invite you to rule and reign here. May my thoughts and my actions reflect your character. And just as one day Jesus is going to rule and reign from the city of Jerusalem, and so now he can rule and reign in and from your heart. Do not be afraid of the enemy. There is no weapon that is formed against you that can prosper. When I think about what Jesus said about this, this church and their location, they were located uh, in this city where he, Jesus himself said Satan has his throne. And then he said, and yet you have remained loyal to me. Now, that takes a lot of courage. A location where not only Satan's presence is there, but principalities and powers of darkness no doubt frequented that city. When you've got a place where Satan has a throne, there's no doubt that there's high level of demonic power that is present in that area. So I want you to pay close attention to what Jesus says about this church that is located in an area where there is a lot of demonic traffic. Because you may have experienced something similar in your own life, maybe a family member of yours, maybe a friend. Maybe there is not a city perhaps, but maybe a domain where the demonic has been welcomed in and Satan has set up shop and there is a lot of demonic presence. Jesus says, 
you have remained loyal to me, even though you live in a city where Satan has his throne. You refused to deny me, even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. Satan's city. Pergamum, called by Jesus, Satan's city. Jesus says, my faithful witness, Antipas, gave his life and was faithful to me, and even though you saw his life taken, you still remain steadfast. Sometimes we can be afraid when we see others around us go through something difficult, but God has called all of us to remain steadfast and faithful to him. This was a wonderful commendation. Uh, What a great statement that Jesus was able to say that you have remained loyal to me even though you live in a city where Satan has his throne. Even though my faithful witness Antipas was killed, you've remained faithful. Even though you live in Satan's city, you have remained steadfast. Those are good commendations. Then in verse 14, Jesus says, but, but I have a few complaints against you. And then he starts to list the things that need to be changed. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols, and by committing sexual sin. Now, let me take you back to the story. God's people were moving forward. And Balaam was hired by an ungodly king to curse God's people. Now, it was known that Balaam uh, was a prophet, And what often happened in those days is that whoever wanted to have the ministry of the prophet, uh, they would essentially come with a gift, like a payment of sorts, an honorarium. And they would give that money and they would say, would you please? And then they would would share what they wanted. I need an answer from the Lord on this matter. Would you please help me with that? Pray, ask the Lord. So uh, King Balak basically hired Balaam and said... I would like you to come, and I want you essentially to curse God's people for me because I know you've got a lot of clout with God. And so when you pray, I know things happen. So how about we say that you pray that God will curse his own people, and it'll put God in a jam, and somehow I'm going to win this battle over the people of Israel. And so what did Balaam do? Well, we, you may re- remember the story well. He wouldn't listen really to God. And so even the donkey that Balaam was riding on had to speak because an angel with a flaming sword stood in front of Balaam. And God opened Balaam, uh, Balaam's donkey's mouth and he spoke. And then God opened Balaam's eyes and Balaam saw the angel. And the angel said, if your donkey had not stopped, I would have killed you. The donkey had more sense than the man who was supposed to be a prophet of the living God. So then, fast forward, and this is not immediately in that story. But so Balaam ended up going, and oddly enough, he offers these sacrifices on these high places, these mountains. And he, and he wants to ask God to curse the people of God. And so he, he begins to pray, and he says, well, I can only say what God says. So he, he at least had enough sense to say that. And each time he asked God, God said, no way. No way I'm not cursing my own people. And so Balak says, well, maybe, maybe your God only listens if you're on another location. So let's go over to this mountain. And he went over there. Offer another offering. Pray another prayer. Same answer. He did this a few times, and Balak was getting frustrated. Balaam thought of a crafty plan. Because God's people would not be cursed by God through prayer, he came up with the crafty plan that if he could get God's people involved in sexual immorality 
and idol worship, he knew the word of God, which God had said, if you do those things, I will punish you for that. And just like the enemy for every single one of us, he tries to set us up. And that's exactly what he did with the children of Israel. And so Balaam proposed a plan and said, let's trick them into disobeying God to such a degree that God will end up having to put curses on them because of their disobedience. And thus, the teaching of Balaam. And so Jesus is saying here, you tolerate some in your church just like Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel, teaching them to sin by eating food offered to idols and committing sexual sin. And in the similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Now, if you remember to the church in Ephesus, the one that Jesus said, you've lost your first love. He had some good things to say about them. They worked hard, but they had lost their passion for God. And he says in that church in Ephesus, he said this in verse 6, you have this in your favor that you hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. Now you look at the church in Pergamum and they were tolerating those same things. Jesus called it out. He didn't gloss over these things because sin always has an effect. It has effect on you, an effect on you personally. It has effect on your marriage. It has an effect on your family. It affects you even though you may not think so. So Jesus was looking at the church and giving them a synopsis of where their heart was. He was using the double-edged sword, a scalpel, you might say, that a surgeon would use to be able to properly get in there and cut out whatever needs to be cut out. We had a, a wonderful man at the church on the island of Martha's Vineyard where he was a deacon in the church, very faithful, diligent worker, and got the call one day as, my, um, as they were heading off, uh, found some news that he had a brain tumor, and they were actually rushing him in ambulance uh, to the hospital in Boston. As they, uh, as they were waiting for the ferry to arrive, my son and I rushed down to the dock and we prayed for him before he left in the ambulance. From that time, for a, for a few months, there was great spiritual battle. And the doctors had to go in, they had to open up, and they had to use the scalpel, and they had to remove the tumor. The problem was, is after they went in and saw what was there, there was 2% that they couldn't touch because the doctor said it's in such a place that I fear that if I make the wrong cut, I may affect his thinking. So I just can't touch that spot, but I got out 98%. Sewed him back up, and uh, he was a different person. He spoke in many ways, uh, forgetting basic things, still had a heart of gold. And unfortunately, that 2% ended up growing. And it grew to the point where he went from this life to the next in the presence of the Lord. It was a very difficult time for the church body. It's a difficult time for the family. But the scalpel that God uses never leaves any bit behind. See, we're limited in the natural as to what we can get out, but God isn't. And so in the spiritual realm, 
if Jesus were the surgeon, every bit of what would cause destruction would be removed because he is the one with the perfect double-edged sword and he knows how to cut what needs to be cut out. Sometimes we can allow God to work on certain areas of our lives because we're okay with it. We, we're willing to give this up. We're willing to give that up. But then there are other things that are a little bit harder. And God begins to work in that area, and we begin to recoil under it. Say, God, I'm willing to be transformed a little bit, but that, that's too much. That hurts. It's been a part of my life for so long, and I don't want to be changed. I want to tell you something, friends. God sees every single thing in our lives and in our hearts. God wants us to walk holy before him. And in this congregation, the words of Jesus to each one of us are, open up your heart so that I can get in there and I can cut out whatever needs to be cut out. If you allow him to do the cutting, he'll take out 100%. He will. And there will be no chance of you being taken captive by that 2% continuing to grow to end up taking your spiritual life. But you have to allow him to do his work. If you say, no, stop, I don't want you to do any more, God pulls his hand back, and what we don't realize is sometimes when we ask God to pull back on the work of transformation, what we are not allowing him to get out is what will end up affecting us. Allow God to do the work in your life. The next verse, verse 16, is the remedy for you and me. It says, repent of your sin. Repent of your sin. John the Baptist, he said, repent because the axe is already laid at the root of the tree. And if you don't repent, the tree is going to be cut down. Jesus said to the church in Ephesus, repent or I will remove your candlestick. To the church in Smyrna, there were no negatives that Jesus mentioned. But now to the church in Pergamum, Jesus says, repent. What are they supposed to repent of? Repent of what he just talked about. Repent of allowing a tolerating immorality in the church. Repent of encouraging those who would be caught up in anything other than God, which becomes an idol. He says, repent of your sin, or this is the consequence. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, I love encouraging verses in the Bible. And one of my favorites is Romans 8.31. And it says, if God be for you, who can be against you? And that is very encouraging, isn't it? And so God wants you and I to know that when he's on our side, we have nothing to fear. But let me give you the flip side. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. And here he's talking to believers very clearly laid out, where he gives the context of referring to brothers and sisters. And he continues in verse 26, and he says, and listen closely, because this applies to every one of us in this room. If we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation judgment and the raging fire that will consume his anyway, enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant 
which made us holy, as if it were common and unholy, and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit, who brings God's mercy to us. For we know the one who said, I will take revenge, I will pay them back. Now listen to this. It says, he also said, the Lord will judge his own people. He's not talking here about sinners. You see that? His own people. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten. And sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So look at these people that he's talking to. He's talking to people who have already started running a great race. I mean, what a wonderful characteristic. These people, they were exposed to public ridicule. They were beaten for Christ. They were thrown into jail. Everything they owned was taken from them, and they accepted it with joy. They loved the Lord. But verse 36 gives a warning. It says, do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. And remember the great reward that it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. Friends, don't take for granted your walk with God. You must remain faithful and steadfast. You cannot give up. You see here, Jesus gives a warning. He says... You must repent or I will come to you suddenly and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. So what God speaks to every single one of us in this room is we need to have a holy and a healthy fear of the Almighty God. It keeps us in line. I need it and I'm the pastor. You need it as well. Never take for granted the blood of Jesus. Never take it for granted. Yes, he died for you, but don't take it for granted. The moment you begin to perpetually walk in disobedience to the Lord, I don't know where God draws that line, but there comes a time when God draws the line and says, you cannot continue to step on my blood any longer. And what happens is when we tolerate those things in our lives or in those around us, then God is displeased. Now, what does it mean to tolerate? You are not necessarily responsible for someone else's decision. Someone else can make a choice, and that's not automatically your fault. But let's say you were in a situation where you had a friend, and your friend was about to rob a bank. Okay? And your friend begins to explain explain to you exactly how they're going to do it, and they begin to give you the whole plan. Now, you're not a part of it, but you're sitting in the room and you're listening. Going, hmm. And you know everything that's going to happen. And let's say you say absolutely nothing to your friend, and you just let them go on their merry way. Do you think you would have any culpability even though you may not show up the bank, at the bank to rob it? Absolutely. Because you did not do what you should have done. And so what happens in the spiritual realm is the same thing. There is a certain degree of responsibility that you and I have when we remain silent and tolerate things that dishonor God. So what, do, what are we supposed to do? The Bible tells us that what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to confront our brother or sister in Christ about that particular matter. You have to address it. The proper process for that person who has a friend about to rob a bank needs to say, hold on a second. First of all, you're my friend, and my friends don't rob banks. Get a hold of yourself, man. What's going on? 
That's what a good friend would do. They wouldn't sit there and go, oh, Rob Bank, is this your first time? <laughs> but what's difficult sometimes, and it's difficult for me, is confrontation. Anybody love confrontation? You just can't wait to talk to someone about a difficult matter. Not me. It's hard. But we become responsible when we tolerate things that dishonor God. So what are we supposed to do? You need to speak in love about the matter and bring attention to what the Word of God says. And in this particular, I'm right in line with what it's saying here, talking about sexual immorality and idol worship. God says, I won't play games with that. Neither should you. And what does he say? He says, repent. Repent. Now, I'm just going to make some general statements, and the Holy Spirit takes statements, and he appropriates them as needed. Sexual immorality has no place in this body of Christ. Nobody in this place should be involved in fornication or adultery. Nobody should, because it dishonors God. And I need to tell you that. Some of you may say, well, that's, that's taken for granted. Some people don't take that for granted. It has no place in this body of Christ. When two people care about each other, there is a process from singlehood to being married. Honor God in the process. Honor God in the process. God never intended for people to attempt the married life before getting married. No one in this church body should be living together before marriage. Nobody. And it's very important that we live according to the Word of God. And I don't believe that's legalistic. That's just what Jesus said. And the truth is, is if we simply do what we want to do, we're going to hear these kinds of words. And I would rather know now than know later. You know what I mean? When it's too late. You and I have a chance to get it right. So let's get it right. Your past can be your past. But from today, God gives you the opportunity. That's why the scripture says today is the day of salvation. You and I are not guaranteed tomorrow. And that word is not only for the unbeliever, it's for the person who claims to follow Christ but lives in utter rebellion against God in living in sin, in tolerating things like that. Now, I imagine that these people that Jesus is writing to well, they were a part of the church because this is a letter to the church. It's very possible that they were attending the services on a regular basis. And yet they were tolerating things that dishonored God. Friends, God says to you, I want to do spiritual surgery. And if you're willing, I'll cut out whatever needs to be cut out. Now, God always deals with things from a private to a public level. That's how he does it. And if someone won't relent in the private, he'll end up dealing with it in the public. I remember one of the evangelists that had a big fall. God had sent a word to that person prior to anything becoming public. And the, prophet, uh, the, the prophecy that God gave is, uh, was very specific and said, if you don't deal with this now, then I'm going to uh, expose this to the world. And the person who heard that word did not respond in obedience. And do you know what God did? Exactly what he said he would do. You see, sometimes as parents, we find it hard to follow through. We say one thing, and then after that, we're like, oh, maybe give another chance, another chance, another chance. God is merciful, but he is also a disciplinarian. And when he speaks, we need to listen because he follows through. So when God speaks to us through his word, and this is his word I'm sharing with you today, he follows through. So to everyone in this room this morning, be on notice. You have heard 
the word from the Lord today. If you choose to live in rebellion, in allowing your eyes to see things they shouldn't see, in allowing your body to be involved in things it should never be involved in, or if you're allowing yourself to be pulled away from God to put other things as idols first in your life, then God's word remains the same as it was to the church in Pergamum. He said the same two-edged sword that I would use to cut out the cancer. He said, listen to this, I will come and I will fight against you. So I love the word, if God be for you, who can be against you? But this is also a true statement. If God is against you, who can be for you? It's biblical. She's not written that way, but it's biblical. So I want to tell you, get it right. Now, God's not looking down and expecting perfection and, and expecting for you to never fall or never fail. But what he will not tolerate is in your heart and mind to come to a conclusion to say, I am set in what I'm doing. I'm going to continue to do what I do. That's different than coming to God crying your, your heart out before him and saying, God, I want to be clean before you. Please change me and transform me. And then you end up failing or falling, and then you come back to God and you sincerely ask him for help. God can work with that. What God cannot work with is a stubborn and a hard heart that says, I heard your word, pastor, but I'm fine the way I am. And I'm telling you right now, if you keep on that path, you're going to have him to deal with. And when you do walk in disobedience, and I'm not the one who makes the decisions he does, but you expose yourself to all kinds of things. When Jesus says, I will fight against you, what do you think he uses to fight against us? All through the word, God allows the enemy to do things because the gates of protection are opened and unfortunately the enemy comes in and wreaks havoc. When David was given three options for the discipline that God told him he would have to go through because of his disobedience, one of the options was that the enemy armies would be, be allowed to invade the people, if you remember that story. And this was one request that David had. He said, God, I would rather have you punish me directly than to use the invading armies. So I submit myself to whatever you do personally, but please don't use another nation to do it. But God was ready to do that. So don't think that sickness is off the table as a, as a weapon that God would use to fight against us. Okay? Don't think that... Um, Chaos and economic challenges are off the table that God couldn't use to fight against us. And now I've talked to you all about healing and how God can provide. I've said all those messages, so that's, that's all true. For those of you here for the first time, there's other things I preach on. <laughs> but this is also part of the Word of God. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's very important that we recognize that God will follow through when he speaks. When you humble yourself, here's what God says, I will have grace upon you. And I thank God for that because, my friend, I've needed it. I've needed it, and I need it every day. I'm going to ask if we could all close ourselves in with the Lord. And I want to just share this with you before we move to the next part, and that is this. Jesus said, To everyone who is victorious, and this is what he said to the church in Pergamum, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give to each one a white stone, and on that stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. And to the church in Ephesus, he said, to him who overcomes, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. And to this church, and to Smyrna, rather, he said, to everyone who is victorious, 
they will not be harmed by the second death. God never plays favorites. What he makes available to one, he makes available to all. And God's call to all of us this morning is get right so that my sword can be used in your favor. And if I need to do cutting, may it be to cut out the spiritual cancer. But may it not have to be used so that I will fight against you. The Spirit of the Lord says to each one of you today, repent if you are holding on to anything that dishonors the Lord. Now, that doesn't necessarily need to be shared with everybody as far as what the Spirit of God is speaking to you. But I'm going to ask you this morning to respond to the Spirit of the Lord. And I believe it's important. One of the ways that John the Baptist did that was when he was in the Jordan and he said, repent of your sins, and they were baptized in water as a demonstration that they were giving up their old, their old life. If you're in this room, and it doesn't matter what kind of sin that you are surrendering to the Lord, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and said, repent, or I will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. God's call to you today is, if you listen, He'll respond with blessing and He'll restore. But if you harden your heart, then even God Himself will fight against you. And I don't know about you, friend, but I don't want that at all. So as your pastor, I urge you, get right with God. Now, without sharing the details, but God knows the heart, I believe that every single time the Spirit of God challenges us, there needs to be some kind of response. And I don't exactly know all the details of what the Spirit of God is doing through this message this morning but I know that you needed to hear it. And so I'm going to take a bold step and I'm going to ask you if the Spirit of God has prompted you to repent of something. I want to open these altars and I want to invite you to come and to kneel and to come before the Lord with a heart of repentance. I know that's a bold step, but it's worth it. And it puts a stake in the sand to say this ends here. This ends now. If the Spirit of God is speaking to you, and if you're willing to respond, I just invite you to simply leave your seat, to come to these altars, and to kneel before the Lord, and to ask Him for forgiveness. Your confession is to Him. And as you do, He'll accept it. I'm just going to wait for a few moments and allow the Holy Spirit to speak because this may be difficult for you, but once you get it right, Oh, the joy of victory. If the Spirit of God has spoken, and if you're willing to say yes, if it applies to you, don't harden your heart. Respond today. And let God clean your heart. Lord, speak to your people. Purify us. for your glory. Jesus. Father, 
I've shared with your people your word today. And I humble myself before you. As pastor here at Christian Life Center. And I ask God for your forgiveness for any toleration of immorality in this body, for any toleration of turning our hearts to idols. God, I pray that your standard would be upheld in the leadership of this church, in the leadership of every ministry in this church, and in my own heart, my family, every member of this body, every regular attendee of this body, and even those who may be present today for the first time. God, we ask for your forgiveness. Would you please purify us? Your word says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, I ask you to do that today. Purify your body so that we can be a bride without spot or wrinkle so that when you come back, you can find prepared people ready for your kingdom. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Give us grace and give us strength to remain steadfast and not allow the devil to have a foothold in our lives, in our relationships, in our families, and in this church body. We submit to you today. We honor you and we honor your word. May your two-edged sword remove every bit of spiritual cancer that needs to be removed from this body. I surrender my own heart to your spiritual scalpel today. Thank you that you said that if I confess my sin, if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We cling to that promise today. We thank you for your forgiveness. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. down before him for he is Lord of all sing hallelujah Christ is risen oh what a savior isn't he Christ is risen, bow down before Him, for He is Lord of all, sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Communion is
is a demonstration of our connection to Jesus Christ. You don't need to be a member of this local body to participate in communion. But you do need to be a member of the body of Christ. If you're in this room today and the Holy Spirit has been drawing you to a relationship with Jesus Christ, maybe you have yet to make a decision to ask Him to become the Lord, but today you'd be interested in doing that. Today could be the first day of a brand new life. It could be a new birth for your spirit. Maybe you've gone to church when you were younger and you once did dedicate your heart to Christ. You started well, but you walked off the path. God says to you, come back, I'll accept you home. Regardless of where you stand today, God reaches out to you with redemption in his heart. And if you're in this room before we participate in communion, and you have not yet taken that step of allowing Jesus to be the Lord of your life, I want to invite you to do that. And if you're in this room today and would like to take that step, would you just simply raise your hand? I would love to pray with you before we share communion so that you can be ready to meet Jesus. Is there anyone present that would like to make that wonderful choice today if you haven't already done so? The Holy Spirit says to you, today is the day. Don't wait any longer. One last call. Is there anyone? I sincerely hope with all of my heart that every one of you present are ready to meet Jesus. So now as we share communion together, I read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. The Apostle Paul is writing and he says, I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. And that is why we are sharing communion together today. So if you would take the wafer in your hand, and would you please break it? And let us pray. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for what you did. You have been so kind to us. You have forgiven us of our sin. You didn't gloss over it, for the penalty had to be paid, so you took the penalty yourself. For that, we are so grateful. And as we share the symbol of your body, Jesus, we think about you walking on that Via Dolorosa, carrying your own cross to the place where you would give your life willingly because we we're on your mind and in your heart. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins. We appreciate your sacrifice. Amen. Let's share together. It goes on to say, in the same way, Jesus took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us now thank the Lord for the symbol of his blood. Lord Jesus, thank you for fulfilling your word that said that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It used to be animals, but the blood of the animals could never effectively, completely take away sin. And so you, Jesus, the Lamb of God, 
unblemished and perfect, who never sinned. You came, and though you were 100% innocent, you paid the price as if you were 100% guilty. Thank you for allowing your blood to be shed by sinful people so that they could be redeemed. Thank you for what you did. We treasure your sacrifice and your precious blood. Amen. Let's drink together. Would you join with me in standing? Isaac, would you lead us in a song as the Spirit of the Lord directs you of gratitude for all that the Lord has done for us? And as we close out this time together, friends, I want you to allow this moment to be a moment that prepares you for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday of this coming week. Would you allow the Holy Spirit to encourage your heart as you honor what Jesus did for you so that you will live out a reflection of His life in the marketplace and in your own homes and communities. Let's sing this song together and let's worship the Lord as we wrap up our time gathered together here in his house. Thank you, Jesus. sorrows I'm trading my shame I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord I'm trading my sickness I'm trading my pain I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord trading my sorrows I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame, I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. Yes, all right, to clap, church. I'm trading my sickness, I'm trading my shame, I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. One more time. I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame, I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Said I'm trading my sickness and pain, I'm trading my sickness, I'm trading my pain, I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. One more time, say yes to the Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Say yes, yes, Lord, amen. Say yes, yes, Lord, amen. Let's give the Lord praise for all that he has done for us. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. Amen. God bless you and have a great week in the presence of the living God.